Welcome to the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority for summer camp, virtual summer camp, uh, slippery fish and slithery snakes. If you're on right now and you could tell me, um, can you actually hear my voice right now? We're doing a test. Hello, welcome to the program. Try not to wiggle so much. <laughs> it's Richard. People. Hello, welcome. Come on in. Look at our office. Oh. Hey, Angie, could you tell me right now? Can you actually hear my voice still? Is it really clear? the Los Alamitos Creek Trail. Hi, Richard. Hello. That says, yeah, that's Ron Horry. It says, hi, Richard. Ron. Ron's been on my mind lately. So let's do this. I, I'm not sure if they can actually hear me or not. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and introduce yourself and let them know that this is summer camp. And Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Tejeda. Um, I'm honored to be here, invited by Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Uh, this is part of a week-long virtual uh, series, and today is uh, like uh, slithery snakes and slippery fish. Yeah, there you go. And um, so, <laughs> welcome. Today we're at Los Alamitos Creek. Uh, I am the founder and executive director of a new nonprofit called uh, Saved by Nature. And if you're wondering what I've been up to lately, um, I've just been uh, trying to change the world, you know, uh, change the tide and use my uh, cultural significance uh, to uh, bring more people of color uh, into parks and into nature. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about, um, about our uh, anadromous fish species they call our waterways home. And then after that, we have like a special surprise that Terry's going to be uh, busting out and it's going to be just great and exciting. <laughs> so thank you for being here. So we wait for some people to join. So we actually have 27. So oh, wow. To go. We have plenty of people. Let's go ahead and get started. So anyhow, um, you know, uh, we're here along Los Alamitos Creek. Um, and it's a beautiful place. Uh, lots of native trees around, like uh, right behind me here, uh, is a beautiful willow tree. Um, and if you know anything about willow, it's known for uh, its uh, basketry, and so like Native American baskets and things. And so just wanted to point it out because it is part of the riparian corridor. And so right next to Los Alamitos Creek, we see a lot of water-loving uh, trees and plants, and one being uh, the willow. So if you, it's really flexible and bend bendable, and that's why they use it to make baskets and things. Uh, so lots of willow around here. That's what, that's kind of what I'm seeing around here is lots of willow. But we do have Los Alamitos Creek and Los Alamitos Creek is a little gem. If you didn't know, it's one of my favorite places to go and escape when I want to get out and think. Lots of times uh, it's my office for the day. Uh, instead of being at home and, and working from my kitchen uh, and, and checking emails and doing things like that uh, or having meetings, I'll come out here and go for a walk and I'll check emails out here listening to the water and really taking nature in because uh, there's this gentleman called uh, Muscle Collie, uh, a gentleman that I know, he's this humongous bodybuilder. And he says that, you know, or Arnold Schwarzenegger actually said that lots of people when they go to the gym, they run through the motions, but they don't get into the muscle. And I'm guilty of coming out into nature and running through the motions. And, but we sometimes, I forget to focus on nature and kind of, you know, getting into that. And, you know, what does that entail? Well, that entails, you know, touch and smell and taste and just really looking at nature and in really enjoying it. And so just wanted to bring that up and remind people when you're out in nature, remember what you're there for and enjoy the beauty, enjoy the sounds. And that's kind of what we're here for today. Uh, again, just wanted to introduce you to this place. It is a tributary uh, to the ancient Guadalupe River. So the Los Alamitos Creek and Guadalupe Creek that starts over at Mount Umanum, they create <clears throat> the Guadalupe River. Now, uh, these two create this big river, and in that big river, we get anadromous species. We get two types of species. We, get, we don't really get our Chinook salmon 
in Los Alamitos Creek because it's a smaller creek and our big Chinook salmon, I'll show you uh, shortly, they get really, really big and they like the Guadalupe River because it's a wide river. And then also Guadalupe Creek, we get uh, stillhead rainbow trout that come up here, uh, up Guadalupe Creek, and we get stillhead rainbow trout that come up Los Alamitos Creek. And so it's important because my saying is, how do we expect people to care about something they know nothing about? So uh, one of my ambitions in life is to educate people about salmon and trout they call Santa Clara County home. Uh, it's important. It's why open space is so important to protect our upper watersheds because if we don't protect those, our water quality down here wouldn't be so well and we wouldn't have salmon and trout. Just their mere presence of ha having salmon and trout, them being indicator species says that somebody is doing something right uh, in our county and uh, environmentally. And so uh, let me show you some posters that I have here. And so the first poster that I have and want to show you is a picture of the steelhead rainbow trout. And so lots of people like to call me Richard the Rainbow Trout. Um, and that is because I've spent uh, over a decade educating people about these wonderful uh, anadromous species. When I say anadromous, that means that they're born either here in Los Alamitos Creek, the Guadalupe River, Coyote Creek, Guadalupe Creek, Stevens Creek, whatever it may be. And then they work their way down into like uh, the San Francisco Bay, like kind of uh, over at Don Edwards. And that's where they're going to hang out and acclimate before going out uh, towards the South San Francisco Bay underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and out to the Pacific Ocean where they get really big. So when they're in our creeks in the beginning, this is what they look like. This is an elevin right here. That there is their yolk sac. And then they turn into what's called a par. This is when they're smolts. And this is when they're like over by Don Edwards. And then they move out into the ocean and they change a, a color. And that is uh, to protect them uh, from predators. And so if you're a predator looking underneath, looking up, you'd see a white belly, which matches perfectly with the sky. If you're looking down, you see a dark color, which matches perfectly with the ocean floor. And so, but when they return back, uh, they're going to change color and they're going to come back underneath the Golden Gate Bridge through the San Francisco Bay, through Don Edwards and into the Guadalupe River and into one of the tributaries, uh, maybe like um, Los, Al uh, Los Gatos Creek, Guadalupe Creek or um, Los Alamitos. OK, so these uh, can be, you know, five to ten pounds, you know, here in our waterways. They're more about three, four, five pounds. Right. But in the Chinook salmon, actually, these guys in our waterways can get like 25 pounds. And so this is the Chinook salmon. Okay. Well, so Jan has a question. She says, so they can live in fresh and salt water? Yeah, making the, and that's what uh, anadromous means. That's a great question. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they've uh, adapted through, you know, possibly hundreds of thousands of years. And you can come up with your own conclusion on why you think they had to uh, be able to evolve and migrate to the ocean. We're a very arid place. And as you can see, if, if Terry shows you the water, the water is very low right now. And that's because it's summer. And so if you were a fish, would you want to hang out here when the water is low? Well, one of the reasons why you don't want to hang out here when the water is low is because of predators right <laughs> so these long little legs what's up dude what's going on everybody <laughs> all right let's get excited everybody right oh, i'm so happy to be out here in nature oh my god okay so we look at this great uh, blue heron and has long legs right and so can you picture this great blue heron just walking around in the water and it's shuffling its feet and it has this long it has this s-shaped neck it's going to coil up and it can just catch fish with its beak spear them and stuff so if you were a fish if you were a trout if you were a salmon and you were really big, would you want to be in here in summer? I don't think so, right? Because you get picked off. So the smaller fish hang out in here, though, uh, when they're about this size. What kind is this again? This is a Chinook salmon, oh. your king salmon. You know, a lot of people uh, go to restaurants and eat these things. I just ask that when you do do that, just ask, hey, where did the salmon come from? Did it come from a sustainable source? If they don't know, then it's probably not a good idea to eat it, you know? Anyhow. So we got these little fish. This is when they hang out here. Do you guys want to see what they look like? Uh, kind of like they're no longer alive, but I'll, I'll show you a real specimen so you can get an idea of how small they are, okay? So this came from a hatchery. And a hatchery is a place where they grow fish, you see, because uh, we've built a lot of dams and we have so many millions of people nowadays that as when we put in these dams, 
as a way to uh, mitigate, to make up for it, uh, we, uh, the government, started fish hatcheries to supplement the fishery. And so they grow millions of fish in fish hatcheries. And this is what they look like. And so this is an egg. Uh, it is clear. Uh, and that means that it is not fertile and it will not hatch. But once they become fertile, they have these little black dots. And that's actually eyeballs looking back at you. And that's an eyed egg. Eventually, once they hatch, uh, that is their yolk sac. That's their belly. That's their food for the next 30 to 45 days. Uh, they're so tiny that they can't eat any macroinvertebrates, aquatic insects from the water. Uh, so they, that's their food source. Once that absorbs, it's going to absorb right into their body. And as you can see, you see a little lump there, but not much. Some of them still have a little tiny lump. And that is uh, just absorbing right into its body and it becomes a fry. And so these are, you're looking at the very first stages of the Pacific salmon uh, uh, life stages. And so you can see they're very fragile, they're very tiny, and they're here. And right now, as we speak, there are little fry underneath that uh, little uh, bank there, underneath the willow. They're hiding under there, I can guarantee you. And, uh, and there's... Um, Possibly no eggs at the moment because uh, the season for spawning is over. Uh, but this is where they hang out uh, during that time, okay? So Lena's asking if they can live in brackish water. So they can. So uh, remember when I said that uh, they... Uh, so that's a very important question, okay? Because when they move out to Don Edwards, that is brackish water. Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. That is where the Guadalupe River meets the South San Francisco Bay. So it is being influenced by tidal flow. It is brackish water, a mixture of fresh and salt. That's when they're going to change psychologically, physiologically. So they're coming from fresh water. They're migrating down. They stop at Don Edwards and they begin to acclimate. They change kind of like a teenager changes psychologically, physiologically. They're able to uh, now get rid of the salts. Uh, they're, they're getting ready to be able to get rid of the salts. And then they move into uh, the salt water uh, or make their way through the San Francisco Bay and then, then into the salt water. If uh, a fish does not have an estuary, they can die. And that's why they're so important. But unfortunately, 95% of our estuaries have been turned into parking lots or apartment complexes. So it's very important that we protect places like the estuary at, uh, next to the beach boardwalk, the estuary down at Don Edwards, okay? So yes, brackish water, and they have to do the same thing when they come back. They don't necessarily live there uh, unless some are, are kind of trying to find um, more water. They can go down there and hang out there. We really don't know how long, that's the thing. We don't know how long scientifically it takes for them to smultificate. That's what it's called scientifically. Smultificate? It's called smultificate. Oh smultification, okay? I'm, I'm nerding out on you guys, right? <laughs> smultification. And here we go. This is what they look like. Uh, the female has a soft jaw. The male has a hook jaw. Again, they change color. This is what they look like, you know, when they enter uh, the river system. They're changing a the spawning color um, and, and things like that. And so I uh, just wanted to show you uh, kind of like what they eat and depend on. You might have uh, been to one of our virtual programs in the past where we've learned about uh, macroinvertebrates. And so fish don't eat McDonald's. Uh, they eat uh, macroinvertebrates, aquatic insects, things that you know that you've heard of, but may not have realized that they were fish food like uh, stoneflies and mayflies um, and uh, dragonflies and um, did I say damselflies and, and uh, things like that. Yes. So lots of them, they're scuds small snails, lots of things that live in the water. Some have a complete metamorphosis, some have an incomplete, and eventually they're going to metamorphosize, become terrestrial, and, and fly away. So fish food, fish food. I just want to show you this poster because it's cool. <laughs> and it's just the anatomy of a fish, right? Lots of bones. They have inter internal organs, and those organs allow them to be able to smultificate. They're able to, um, you know, change... Um, inside as well that allows them to do that so they're amazing uh, amazing uh, fish there's not many that can uh, that are anadromous like the striped bass is which is non-native but are only like native type species that can do that are our, our, our salmonids uh, which is a, a sort of evolution when they when they do 
uh, when they do migrate, they have lots of things to deal with. As you can see, this poster here is no longer in production. I'm lucky enough to have this. Got it from Canada or something. And this is about how they make their migration. So if you notice here, uh, you have a fish going out, migrating out. And then you have a fish migrating in. And you can see they're changing color. So they're like silver on the way out. They get out to the ocean. They're silver. They're starting to come up. They're still silver. But you can see that they start to change color as they start to metamorphosize. And uh, so they're in their spawning color. Along the way, they have lots of predators to deal with, like we talked about. You can look at this poster and name some yourself. You could put it in the comments. Does anybody see any predators that you'd like to put in the comments here? How about anything that you see that might just be bad news for them in general? There's so much they have to deal with. This poster is so busy, but it just gives you an idea, Marcus right? Is asking, what do you mean by spawning colors? Do the colors help with reproduction? So we think that they change color for spawning to let others know that they're spawning and also uh, so that they can school together and see themselves kind of underwater. And so that's what I've heard, um, which makes sense because they usually come up when it's rainy, the water's murky, you know? People are saying for predators or seeing bears. Bears, absolutely, right? There's a bear at Ranch Canado del Oro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we see bears, we see golden eagles, uh, we see this mining pit, which reminds me of just injustices that we're dealing with here you know humans that are fishing humans that are fishing um just so many predators you have um this logging going on here this neighborhood going on here and just a lot there's there's this little pollution site here so things that they have to do so when we think about them you know think about the things that we can do to help them because they have a lot to deal with and that's what we talk about and that's why when we hear about their population declining you know, it's just mainly because of, uh, of population growth and loss of habitat is the number one reason, loss of habitat. And so we look at this little uh, riparian corridor, which used to be miles long at one point, and now it's only 100 feet or, you know, 50 feet. And so uh, very interesting, our salmon and trout. And the reason why they're so important, ladies and gentlemen, is because uh, if you didn't know, we owe the Great Salmon Forest, which runs all the way from Oregon into the Sierra Nevada and down into California, and that is... Uh, including the Santa Cruz Mountains. If you've ever wondered why they're so lush and just so green, you know, you should kind of be a little bit worried because for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, these fish have migrated into our upper, you know, watersheds and forests and they die. And when they die, their body gets dragged into the forest some miles, some feet by gray foxes, by coyotes, by bears, uh, by birds. And where that body lays, it decomposes and provides nutrients. And soon a plant or a, or a tree grows. And so uh, we owe the great salmon forest and all of our just amazing forests to these anonymous fish that have been delivering millions of, um, of tons of nutrients to our forests for over 150,000 years. And so uh, this is kind of just tells you a little bit about that and how you know where their body lays there's a picture of an orca because orcas i love to eat chinook salmon my theory is is why they're so smart it's because uh, salmon are rich in omega-3s and <laughs> and things like that and so uh orcas are amazing right and so it's just one beautiful uh you know food web one beautiful life cycle and just a way that these anadromous species are part of and keystone species as well of our of our uh, waterways here in Santa Clara County. Yeah. All right, so um, I don't want to take too much time. How much time do we have anyway? So, so we're at about the 20 minute mark. All right, let me take like five more minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then I, and I want to give it up. I don't want to hog it all. <laughs> all good. I love being here. You guys are going to be here for two hours. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so one of the cool things that I've never shared publicly uh, is uh, the one of the murals that I, I worked on when I worked at Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. I was there when we dis rediscovered the beaver after 150 years. I worked with an organization called Wildways Illustrated and uh, put up uh, two or two murals at the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy Visitor Center. And this is the uh, kind of the what is it? The 
yeah, like the proof of, uh, of the actual thing this is what I was given. And so if you didn't know, we do have beaver that live in Guadalupe River, which is a tributary. This is a tributary to the Guadalupe River, okay? And so the cool thing is that we do have these beaver, and you can tell these beaver uh, by looking for their beaver dams, looking for uh, beaver chewings, right? So if you're walking along a waterway and you see something like that, there's a good possibility that it's a beaver in that vicinity. Um, in, in, within this beaver uh, dam, what I noticed when I swam in the beaver dam above Lexington, uh, which this is a representation of that, is that underwater are all of these native fish, including the, still, uh, the rainbow trout, uh, uh, suckers, and uh, California roach, and all of our native fish live uh, in the pond that is created when the beaver dams up that water, as well as birds come to feed off of things like tadpoles and stuff. And so we see, uh, and also mammals come, we see kestrels. Uh, it's just, uh, again, another keystone species in Santa Clara County that provides, we have the beaver sleeping in the little den. It comes in through this, uh, in through here, this entrance and it swims underwater and it comes up and it goes in and it goes in its little den and that's where it's nice and safe and it hangs out and it sleeps. They have so many cool adaptations. They have two sets of eyelids. They got two sets of lips so they can like chew underwater and like when they like, and so like if you ever jump in uh, the water and you get like water in your eyes and stuff, they got a clear set that comes down. So like when they're swimming underwater and there's like a stick sticking out, they, they don't poke themselves in the eyeball, right? So they got a clear set that comes down. And have you ever jumped in the water and got like water in your ears? Well, they don't have that problem because when they jump in the water, the valve shuts closed and their nose shuts closed. So they have all these cool adaptations that allow them to swim underwater. They have those webbed feet, of course. And then they have this tail that I always thought was used to uh, beat down uh, the dirt, but it's not. It's used uh, to scare away. It's, and it's used mainly as a rudder. It's used as a rudder. And so I was like, I was like, wow, forever I thought it was used to pat down. They use their hands to pat, pat things down. Star is asking, um, are there plans for beaver reintroduction and what do beavers eat? So the beavers were reintroduced uh, in 1979 by a couple uh, Department of Fishing uh, Wildlife game wardens above Lexton Reservoir. And those have been there. And those are the ones I like to go and visit. And, but uh, what happened was, after 150 years, we've seen some at Guadalupe. So we don't know uh, if the ones at Guadalupe came from Lexton and walked down, you know, or if they came from the bay because they can swim from Martinez if they wanted to, you know, they can swim a long, a long distance. And so we're not too sure. Say so they were reintroduced. And the reason why they were overhunted was because they're waterproof. People made hats out of them, waterproof hats and waterproof jackets. I love beavers. They're so freaking cute. Have you ever seen a baby beaver? Oh my Lord. Right, and they're right here in Santa Clara County. In Santa Clara County, maybe we'll put together a hike, and me and Terry will take you to see some beaver or at least oh, some science and stuff. Okay. Cool. All right, I'm gonna give it up to Terry now. Uh -oh. Thank you guys for listening. Hope I didn't ramble on. I'm just excited. All right. Check out Save My Nature. I'll see you guys soon. Well, this is fascinating. This is great. So, All right, I'll, I'll be camera, we'll camera dude. Little... We're on uneven ground, so that's why I was kind of holding on to it. Dun, dun, dun. More than six feet away. Whoosha. Okay. Ooh. I'm so happy to be here. It's always fun to work with Richard. It's so cool. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about snakes. So some people are nervous about snakes and they're like, what if I go? Is the snake gonna like jump out and try to get me? What should I do if I see a snake? things like that. So I wanted to alleviate some of your fears and let you know that, you know, uh, snakes have a job to do and they're really not interested in us. So if you see a snake on the trail, um, there's a couple things you can look at to determine whether or not um, it's a gopher snake or a rattlesnake. So I made some little pictures for you. <laughs> Let's see. Dun, 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 dun. So the one on top is a gopher snake. I've gotten used to seeing them, so I've seen like, you know, the way they're, that they're, um, their patterns look and stuff like that. So if you see this guy out there, he kind of has marking on, on his back that if he's gotten straight, it would look like 
you know, a little ladder that like G.I. Joe or Barbie could climb up. <laughs> so that's one way that you know. And then the other way that you know he's a gopher snake is that look at his eye. So if his eyes are round like that, he's a snake that's awake in the daytime. And, and, and so this is more likely going to be a gopher snake. So this is like probably the most common snake that you're going to see. But the ones that people are scared of or worried about are rattlesnakes. That, 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 right? That's a picture on the top. So uh, rattlesnakes, we do have rattlesnakes. It's the only venomous snake that we have here. Um, we say venomous because he actually has venom sacs in his mouth. And I actually have a picture of what his mouth looks like when it's open. Oh my goodness. Well, you see, check this out. Sorry about the psychedelic colors. My printer was having some issues. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that I always thought that their fangs were just like sticking out. Because when you see them like taxidermies or in pictures or cartoons and things, their fangs are like sticking out. But they're actually encased in flesh. So when they go to bite something, the fangs come through these tiny little holes in that flesh. And then they put poison in there. So a snake that's a rattlesnake will have slitted eyes. So his eye pupils are vertical slits just like a cat. And then um, a gopher snakes would be round. So because he's got these vertical eye slits, you know, that means that, that this snake likes to be awake in the nighttime. But here's a weird idea. How do they do that? If, you know, how are they awake in the nighttime? You know, if, how are they supposed to hunt? Because it turns out that snakes are exothermic. So that means that they get all of their heat from the outside of their body. And that means that if they get cold, they move slow. So, uh, I get so excited. <laughs> so this guy looks scary and everything. He's actually yawning in that picture. That's a big snake yawn. That sounds like a really big truck. <laughs> I'll try to talk into the mic. So, um, if you look at him like this, you can see his tongue sticking out, right? So I always wondered why is their tongue forked? It's kind of weird to have a tongue that splits in two like that. What's that all about? Well, it turns out that um, these snakes can hunt very well in really low light conditions. And so all snakes have adapted this ability to have their tongue be split like this. And it's because when they're looking for food, they slither on the ground like this. They stick their tongue out and they go, oh, it went that way. They're actually smelling with their tongue. Isn't that weird? We smell with our nose, right? I don't go around licking things to find out how they smell. But snakes do. So they stick their tongue out. It grabs the smell particles. They pull it back into their mouth. And they have this little bump on the inside of the roof of their mouth. And that little bump actually tells them what they're smelling. So they're grabbing scent particles and bringing it in. Oh, it went that way. No, wait. It went that way. No, wait. It went that way. So they can actually find stuff by smelling with their tongue. But also, on the face, do, 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 they have... These little holes. And I used to think those little holes were like, you know, their nose. But um, they're actually not. They're actually pit organs. So since they smell with their tongue, they have these basically little heat-seeking organs in the front of their face. So they can see in really low light conditions. They can smell stuff with their tongue. They can sense heat. And they can um, be able to like... Yeah, so that's like their heat-seeking organs, like right here. So they actually did an experiment, and they put snakes into an almost completely dark spot, like a room, and they released a mouse in there, and they found out that like 99% of the time, the snake didn't have to have any vision at all. It could get the mouse based on those other sensory things. So the thing about gopher snakes that you have to watch out for is that they will fake you out. <laughs> When gopher snakes get mad, they curl up and they act like a rattlesnake. They don't have any venom. They don't even have fangs. But they will act like a rattlesnake to scare you or other animals to keep you from eating them. So when we walk up on animals, you know, people say, why does a snake get all coiled up and act all scared and everything? I mean, it scares me that they do that, right? Well, it turns out to them, we're like Godzilla. Boom, boom, boom. We sound heavy. We sound big. They can smell us. We smell big. You know, and, and they're like, something's coming. 
It's like Jurassic Park is going to eat me. And they get really scared. So they become defensive to try to scare us because they're scared we're going to eat them. So keep that in mind. And because snakes are exothermic, that means they have to depend on outside sources to control their body temperature. It's not like us where our body temperature stays one thing. They have to go out into the sun in order to get warm, in order to be able to move, in order to catch their food. But not only that, to be able to digest their food, they have to be warm. So rattlesnakes come out at dusk and they get on the road or they get on the trail and they lay there and they soak up the heat. And then they're like, it's kind of like their cup of coffee. <laughs> now I have the energy I need to go about my day. So that's what they're doing. Um, so if you're worried about snakes, then maybe don't hike at dusk because that's when they're going to be out, you know, warming up so that they can go get their food. So what I brought for you today was my little friend. So this is a pillowcase. It's okay. He can breathe through the pillowcase. I kept him in my little bag here today. Hello, Severus. Hello. Hello. Good boy. So he can't hear me. I just say that to be soothing. And I say that to be, because their ears are on the inside of their body, not the outside. This is Severus. Severus snake. <laughs> <laughs> he might actually do this little gaspy hiss thing that he does. Smell the microphone. So Severus is a gopher snake. See how the pattern on his back looks like you could climb up it like a ladder? And if we look at him closely, he's actually kind of cold right now, which is why he's moving so slow. If you look at him closely, you see him sticking his tongue out? He's smelling the camera and he has little round pupils for his eyes and he has the little pit organs in the front that will sense heat. And so right now he's like pretty, pretty chill. And then if we look at his tail, there's no rattle. That's because he's not a rattlesnake. So he's a gopher snake and he's holding on to me right now like I'm a tree branch. So this snake, this gopher snake is about 12 years old now. If he was in the wild, that would probably be as long as he would live because they have a lot of things they have to overcome. They have lots of temperature things. They have predators. They have cars and bicycles and stuff that wants to eat them. So, um, but if they're in captivity, they can live to be 30, 35 years old. And I got him, he was born in captivity and I got him, um, all the way back in like 2008 or 2009 and so he has like vet visits and he's kept safe and he gets food and he has a place to be warm and a place to hide and a big Barbie swimming pool <laughs> so because he has all that um, I train him and I and I could use him to like visit schools and things to like teach kids about snakes and what they do you want to see the underside of them it's kind of interesting so the scales on the bottom are called scoots and i, I used to say oh because they scoot along the floor <laughs> so they have these scales like that and then people used to ask me how do you know it's a boy or a girl well you can see like this is the scale over here this kind of looks different that is where their organs are so snakes kind of don't have a number one and number two they sort of have a half <laughs> it's a combination of everything everything comes out the same hole so if they have babies the eggs will come out of this hole so they'll actually lay these eggs and they look like little soft footballs that are like made out of leather they kind of look like that and it has everything that the baby snake needs to survive and so when they're born, they eat all of the stuff inside the egg and then they get out of the shell and that nutrients will keep them alive for up to a month, like a whole month. And so, um, but after that point, they have to start eating things and they're really small. So they're like pencil size when they're little like that. What does your snake eat there? 
Mm. So my snake, what I do is this snake, I feed him frozen mice. He doesn't like hair. <laughs> Even though he's big enough to eat full grown mice, he doesn't like the hair. So I get uh, newborn mice that are really small and are pink and they don't have any, um, they don't have any hair on them and he prefers that. So what he'll do is he'll, I put him on a dish and I put it in the tank. I never handle him and feed him at the same time. So he knows that if he sees that little dish, that that's where his food's going to be. It's the only place in the whole tank that his food will be. And he knows that that's when he's supposed to like try to eat it. He never associates my hands with the food. And I'm really careful about that because if you do do that, they could accidentally learn to bite. And every time they see your hand, if they're hungry, they're going to strike at you. So you don't want to do that. Um, snakes are interesting as pets. I, w I don't want you to get ones that f are from the wild and things like that. But um, this guy, I could have permission to have him just by having a fishing license. Gives you permission to have a snake. Um, but what happens is, so this guy was only like a month old. And I was like, oh no, if he doesn't learn to eat... He might die and I was really worried. So I, I defrost these pinky mice and I put them in warm water after they're defrosted. I just put them in warm water to like warm them up because he'll like that better. And then I, what I did was I took a hold, oh, he's gonna hold on to me now. So I took a hold of him like this and I just put his face right on the face of the mouse. And he kind of went, what? Ooh, this smells good. And then he went chomp and he started to eat it. So you want them to eat it from the head down because that way all of their arms and legs like actually lay flat and it doesn't, it's much easier to eat that way. So that's what's interesting about them is that their jaw is not like ours. If you push your chin right here, this bone is one big bone, right? For snakes, it's two. So they have one jaw on the top and then they have like a two on the bottom. So they have like, if you imagine if you had like rubber bands, they have these tendons in here right here and right here so his mouth can open this way like ours and it can also open like this so he can open his mouth really wide and and as long as something is about this size he can swallow it it looks really uncomfortable and it takes a while and they have to walk their mouth around it and and inch their mouth around it before they can get it all but they do I think it's kind of funny because he looks like it has a unibrow. <laughs> if he was a girl, I would have called him Frida. Yeah. So the thing about the, the scale I showed you is that there's no way to tell if a snake is a boy or a girl, this, this kind of snake, unless you take them to the vet and they have to like stick a probe up there and like pull stuff out to look at it. And I just think that's rude. <laughs> um, or if you have a female, they will lay eggs. They're just not fertile. And they'll sit on them and everything, you know, but they're just not fertile eggs. So, uh, but this guy has, you know, I've had him, you know, for a long time now, 12 years, and he's never laid an egg ever. So does anybody have any questions about snakes? Hello, are you cold? He's cold. If he gets up here in my hair, he can sense my heat and he's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Should we take them in the sunlight? They can see what it looks like in the sun. We're kind of in the shade here. <laughs> it might scare somebody coming down the trail, huh? Like, oh my goodness. Right. There we go. He's kind of iridescent, so I think he's getting ready to shed. So what he'll do is, is uh, when he... Oh! It's a very long stomach, <laughs> like a banana balloon, like one of those long clown balloons. And it stretches from here all the way down. So they have like a really long stomach and their intestines do the same thing. Almost everything in their body is very long and skinny. Does, uh, boys can have eggs? Not boys, no. So that's how I know that he's a boy because he's never laid eggs. Do, 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 do. They don't feel like you think they would feel. Like you look at him and you think he's going to be slimy. But he's actually not slimy. Right now he's kind of just like his scales are really dry and smooth. Can I touch oh yeah, yeah.
<laughs> He's digging this heat. Mm. You go, dude. So I take him out pretty regularly to like... He's warming up now. He's starting to get warm. And you'll notice that he'll start to move around a little bit faster as that happens. It's because he's heating up a little bit from the sunlight. It's good enrichment for him too, to be outside. It's very stimulating. It looks beautiful in the sun. Oh. How, how big do they get? So this guy is full grown. And when he stretches out, he's four feet long. When people used to say four feet long to me, I would like freak out and think it was like this ginormous, you know, thing, right? But look how skinny his body is. It's actually not that big, but they can get up to be like six feet maybe. And, if they. And, um, and you've seen this one shed. Yes, many times. In fact, I think. Da, 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 da. Oh, oh nice. this is some of his snake shed right here. So this is a good question. How do they mate or fertilize the eggs? Oh, so what snakes do is they do like a really cool little dance. So the females will let out something that's like a perfume that says that she's ready to have babies. She's ready to like get her eggs fertilized. And then what will happen is they sort of wrap around each other and they and they um, and then their little scale will open up. So his organs will come out and go into her organs. So it's really funny looking. It's not like you think I'll, let, I'll leave that to you to look that up on YouTube nah. with your parents. <laughs> but um, but they do that, but they have to coil up and curl up together and wrap around each other like a spiral in order to do that. And the thing is, once a female smells that way all the male snakes will come not just one so they don't really like get married and have one partner <laughs> they could they could um mate with a whole bunch of different ones but but really you know um they live by themselves most of the time i did know a couple that lived together at allen rock park for a while and they got along well but typically you don't see snakes living together and then once the babies are born the, the parents don't stick around because because bigger snakes could actually eat smaller snakes um, so, so the babies have to take off and do the best they can. Um, <laughs> um, how long do they get again? So they can get up to four to six feet if they eat well and if they, they survive like out in the wild. Yeah, we've seen some big ones. And, uh, yeah. and where, where are we at again? So we're at the Los Alamitos Creek nice. right here. So I think we're probably at a, about 45 minutes now. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for coming and we really appreciate this. And thank you, Richard. Thank you, thank you. Uh oh, happened to my mask. Oh my God. But thank you so much for coming and I'll swap places with you and you can go in front and say goodbye. And, and tomorrow we'll be with the uh, WERC um, and they're gonna do a presentation on nocturnal animals for us. There we go. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hope you had a good time. I know I did. <laughs> you can check out the website for Saved by Nature at savedbynature.org. And you can also check out the website for www.openspaceauthority. Oops. Here come hikers or joggers. I don't want to scare them with my snake. Open Space Authority. And hello. And we will um, be presenting tomorrow. And, and you can also see recordings of all of the stuff that we've already done today. So I will leave you with a beautiful image of the creek. Whoops, snakes trying to play with a camera. Bye-bye <laughs> everybody.